uh, this president's foreign policy is the most feckless uh, in American history. Uh, he's so naive, he would trust the Iranians, and he would take the Israelis and basically march them to the door of the oven. Inside are the ovens which gave the crematorium a maximum disposal capacity of about 400 bodies per 10-hour day. They say it's a government takeover of health care, a big lie, just like Goebbels. You say it enough, you repeat the lie, you repeat the lie, you repeat the lie, and eventually people believe it. The Germans said enough about the Jews, and the people believed it, and you had the Holocaust. You said we live in a Gestapo age, and we're, this is just a quote, we're very much like Nazi Germany, and then you write a book about America the Beautiful. Everyone who lived under the Nazi yoke was in fear of a secret organization, one that Hitler called his deadliest weapon. Without it, Hitler's ambitions could never have been realized. As an instrument of state terror, it's rarely been equal. It was called the Gestapo. If you look back at what happened in Germany, you cannot escape the similarities between what Hitler and his cutthroats did back then and the hate-filled blogs, what they're doing now. One of the first things that the German civilians see as they reach the interior of the camp is the parchment display. On a table for all to gaze upon is a lampshade made of human skin, made at the request of an SS officer's wife. Large pieces of skin have been used for painting pictures, many of an obscene nature. If you go to the 1940s, Nazi Germany, look, we saw in Britain Neville Chamberlain, who told the British people, accept the Nazis. Yes, they'll dominate the continent of Europe. But that's not our problem. Let's appease them. Why? Because it can't be done. We can't possibly stand against them. And in America, there were voices that listened to that. I suspect those same pundits who say it can't be done. If it had been in the 1940s, we would be, have been listening to them. Then, then they would have made television. This is Sasha Piaskowski. He was 13 when he was taken from his home in the ghettos of Łódź, Poland, to the Treblinka extermination camp. He was never seen alive again. No one would ever know how death came to that scared, sweet-faced boy. His brother Yakov, the only member of the once large family to survive the Nazis, was haunted for the rest of his life by nightmares where his brothers and sisters, and particularly young Sasha, would come to him and ask why he hadn't saved them. The photograph is particularly poignant for our family. Sasha's face is almost exactly the same as my oldest son's, which makes sense because Sasha would have been their great uncle. Yaakov was their grandfather. This is Janina Kaminska. She escaped from Poland, but her two brothers were taken to a concentration camp. One of the brothers became sick, and so the youngest, Antosh, bartered with a guard and ripped his tooth out of his mouth so that he could use the gold filling to buy extra rations for his brother. The brother recovered, but the bloody wound in Antosh's mouth grew infected and he died. Yanina would cry for the rest of her life as she thought about the suffering of her beloved youngest brother. He too would have been one of my children's great uncles. Yanina was my mother. This is Stella Hadro. She and her husband Ernst saw what was happening in Nazi Germany and fled in 1937, just as the first concentration camps were being built outside of Berlin. 
Together with their children, they fled through Switzerland, then to France, and then to the United States. Stella had tried to persuade other members of the family to join them, but they refused. They didn't think things were going to become quite so bad. Stella never saw her family again. Ernst abandoned his company, Fishbein and Mendel, a clothing manufacturer that had one of the largest buildings in Berlin. More important, in the center of that building was the city's largest synagogue, holding as many as 1,800 Jews every Friday who would come to worship. The year after Stella, Ernst, and their children fled Berlin, the Nazis gave secret orders that launched the time of terror called Kristallnacht. The Fischbein and Mendel building had its windows shattered, and the synagogue in the center of the courtyard was burned to the ground. Ernst and Stella were my grandparents. Today, the Fischbein and Mendel building is known as the Place of Remembrance, one of the most prominent memorial sites to the people who lost everything, including their lives, in the Holocaust. It's hard to imagine the magnitude of the suffering that Polish, German, and other European Jews went through during this time. It's hard to imagine the torture, the death, the loss of family, the loss of businesses, the loss of everything they owned and everything they worked for. To comprehend that, I think, is beyond human capacity. But there is one thing I can tell you. The Holocaust is nothing like the recent Iran deal or Obamacare, or the national debt, or federal spending. It's nothing like the Obama administration, or gun control, or the Bush administration, or the Tea Party, or the Internal Revenue Service, or any of the other flotsam spewed up in hysterical analogies by vulgarians with more mouth than brain. As my mother-in-law used to say, it has a mouth, so it talks. If you want to make a Nazi analogy, you can look at Russia under Stalin or Cambodia under Pol Pot. But no, there is no comparison in the United States. There is no analogy. And any attempt to do so is an obscene desecration of the millions of people whose ashes now litter the world because of their suffering and burning and torture. So I have one question for all those who wish to make this kind of analogy. How dare you? How dare you brush aside the emotional torment of survivors? How dare you feed into Holocaust denialism by pretending that some difference in political opinion is just as bad as the literal torture and destruction of millions of families? How dare you? Ben Carson, candidate for president of the United States. You said that political correctness was like the Gestapo and the American government like Nazi Germany. And I assume after you said that on national television, that night stormtroopers came and kicked in your door, loaded your family and you onto a train, and sent you off to a concentration camp where you could be murdered and burned. And if not, shut the hell up. Bill O'Reilly, when you said that blogs on the internet were like the murderous tactics of the psychopaths of Nazi Germany, I assume that bloggers have skinned your family and used that to make lampshades. And if not, shut the hell up. And it's not just politicians and political commentators who make these kinds of analogies. Tom Perkins, a multi-millionaire venture capitalist, compared criticism by liberals of income inequality and the excesses of the uber-wealthy to being like Nazi Germany's treatment of the Jews. I assume, given your wealth, that you are now tormented every night in your dreams by the visions of your families who were slaughtered by progressives concerned about income inequality. 
And if not, shut the hell up. And Wayne LaPierre, the head of the NRA, compared gun control to Nazi Germany. I assume, Mr. LaPierre, that when the next gun control law is passed, you will prepare to tear your teeth out of your mouth in hopes of bartering with a guard so that you can save your family member's life. And if not, shut the hell up. Yes, all of you, shut up. Stop spitting on the graves of millions in order to make some stupid political point. This is not a problem of either political party. It is both. Ted Cruz, Rick Santorum, Ben Carson, all political candidates running for the GOP nomination have made the comparison. But then again, so did Democratic Congressman Keith Ellison and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and liberals like Linda Ronstadt and Joy Behar. Even politicians of the past did this. These comparisons are nothing new. Ronald Reagan likened John Kennedy's policies to that of the Nazis. And the late Democratic Senator Robert Byrd compared efforts to change the filibuster rules to the Nazis. Adding to the deplorable nature of this kind of behavior is the fact that the people making these analogies often know nothing about the history. They haven't even bothered to open a history book before besmirching the dead. Just listen to Ted Cruz's analogy to Nazi Germany in his fight to stop Obamacare. He talks about Neville Chamberlain appeasement in the 1940s. Sir, Britain and Germany were at war in 1939. The appeasement of which you speak had nothing to do with Chamberlain going to the British and saying, oh, we can't beat them. Oh, we have to let them take over Europe. Oh, these are people, we can't take them on. It never happened. What occurred was that Hitler wanted to take the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, where there were hundreds of thousands of Germans, and secretly planned afterwards to invade Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia had basically been created after World War I in the Treaty of St. Germain. And the British and the French and the Russians simply didn't care about a country whose name most of their citizens couldn't even pronounce. So yes, they were concerned about London being bombed, about Paris being bombed, but they also knew that the German military was still weakened following the requirements of post-World War I in the Treaty of Versailles. The British, the French, could have destroyed Germany if they had cared about Czechoslovakia. They knew it. They just didn't bother just like you didn't bother to look up the history before you made your obscene comparison. I spent a lot of time trying to understand how people can demean such an unspeakable crime as the Holocaust by comparing it to some minor policy difference. I mean, how can they reduce the organized slaughter of millions to tax increases and international treaties, and health insurance. The only explanation I've been able to come up with is that these are small people who wish they were more. They feel the need to portray themselves as swashbuckling champions of right, fighting back encroaching evil. But they're none of that. They're soft-skinned, well-fed, and snug as they pontificate from their television studios. Listen to me, none of you are heroes. You are people with policy differences who suffer from either an aching lack of knowledge of history or simply a total level of amorality. None of you who compare America or any element of it to the Holocaust or to Nazi Germany fear that you're putting yourselves at risk at all. Fear that the government will do anything to you. You just think it sounds good. As someone whose ancestors were slaughtered or lost everything, let me say this to you. Stop it. Stop besmirching the memories 
of our dead family members. Stop spitting on the ashes of the millions who died in a real time of horror. Stop 